and John 8.32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He asked me this morning, is that all you want me to read? That's it. <clears throat> the truth shall make you. If you're here this morning, uh, welcome. We're glad that you are, are here. If you're visiting, uh, please uh, fill out a card on the back of the pew in front of you. We'd like to have a record of your attendance, and, and uh, hopefully after we're finished with our, our worship, that you will stay around for a little while and let us get to know you and uh, greet you more appropriately. But we're glad everyone's here. It's great to see everyone and to uh, have our church family together. If you would, uh, you can look there in John chapter 8. That's where we're going to spend most of our time to consider uh, this idea of what the truth shall make you. Okay. Now we recognize Jesus says the truth is going to make you free. But the, the fact is, uh, we all have experienced things in our lives that as we experience truth, we experience other stuff too. And so the truth shall also make you a few other things. And those are some of the things that we're going to look at this morning, I guess, on our way to freedom in truth. There's a few other stops that we made. You know, Jesus declared that he was truth personified in John 14 and verse 6. He said, I am the truth. Okay, and, and for the last few weeks, we've kind of looked on Sunday mornings considering the humanist worldview and the idea that there is no truth, and yet as Christians, we stand against that flow and that idea in our world today, and we say, no, there is truth. There is something that we can know for sure, and, and that something is Jesus Christ and the faith that we have in Him. You know, His words, they were truth on whatever issue He addressed. His behavior was truth personified. It was truth in everything he said, everything that he did. And for us as Christians, we have a, an anchor. The anchor for our hope, for our life, is the fact that Jesus Christ is the truth. And we're not just wandering around in chaos, but that we know that there is something true. You know, because of Jesus' relationship with the truth, as being the truth, one would naturally expect the truth uh, to be a key issue with his disciples, with those who follow him. That's talking about us. The truth is something that we must recognize and then also uh, that we must live in our own lives. Just as Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, then we as his followers who desire to be like him should be living lives that personify truth, lives that recognize truth also. Remember, we're to be purified. We're to be sanctified or made holy by the truth. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. It says it's because of truth. Here's this foundational level of our faith that it's built on truth. Jesus was praying in John 17, 17, and he says there, Your word is truth. He's speaking to God and he says, these words that you've given me to say to others, the words that you've inspired to be written down, this is truth. These words are truth. If you ever find yourself uh, feeling like you're drowning in this, this culture of, of acceptance, this, this culture of, of, uh, of chaos, saying there's nothing true and that it's all just up in the air and we can't be sure of anything, go to the Bible. Go to the Word of God because he says this is truth. But before the Word of God makes us free, before that truth frees us, it often accomplishes other things as well. So let's look at a few things that the truth should make you. you know, many of us have been reading the book Muscle and a Shovel. And this is one of the things that really jumps out to me from that book, from the reading of that book of one man's discovery, how he, how he is studying himself out of one system of belief and into the faith in Jesus Christ. How he's going through the Bible and as he recognizes new truths that he didn't know before, how it then empowers him to change. And it, and it forces him, really, to make choices of where he, uh, where he stands and how he will adjust his life according to the truth. It's a great book. I encourage everyone to read it. And if you finished your book, I want to encourage you, pass it on to someone else. Uh, we have a lot of folks here who would like, another, or like a copy of it who haven't gotten one yet. We got more ordered, so they'll be here sometime. We just don't know when, but I want to encourage everyone to read that book and discover and, and watch as this man walks into the truth of God. But as you watch his walk, it's much like all of ours. First, sometimes the truth 
when you hear it, it shall make you uncomfortable. Sometimes truth just makes us uncomfortable. When we listen to the truth and when we encounter it, you know, many times, every time, we bring our personal uh, prejudices, we bring our personal ideas, we bring our, our history into this acknowledgement of truth. And when we bring those things with us, we've got to recognize that, that this is part of me. This is who I am, not a reflection of the truth. Because the truth stands on its own. It doesn't need my background or, or my ideas. The truth is still the truth. It's there, regardless of if I am or not. And so when I come to the truth, I need to recognize this. You know, this is the only explanation of why people don't see the Bible alike. I mean, it's the only one that we can come up with. Think about it. If this isn't the reason that people don't all see the Bible alike based on their own personal backgrounds or their personal views or the other things that they have in their minds, in their hearts, uh, as they approach the truth, well, then the only other explanation can be that, that God, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the, the universe into existence and has commun communicated to us clearly through his word, it's that he can't communicate to his creation. That's the only other possibility if it's not that we ourselves inject his truth with our own ideas or with our own prejudice. Here, Brian, uh, during the Lord's Supper, he uh, spoke about John chapter 6, how that Jesus said some things there that were very hard for them to understand. He knew that some of the people who were following him were just following him because he was able to feed them physically. But he wanted to make them understand, this isn't about the physical food, this is about the spiritual food that I'm providing. This is about something more than just filling your, your belly. And in John 6, in verse 60, he says, uh, it tells us there, therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And in verse 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Because Jesus talked about the fact that his body and his blood was going to be special and something to help them through the rest of their life, that they might have real life. And he was speak, speaking spiritually, but they couldn't understand it at that moment in time. And so they left. They quit following him. They didn't want to believe in him anymore because they couldn't see past the physical aspect of what he was saying. They couldn't get past what he was saying because they were thinking of it with their own prejudice. They were thinking about it with what they had, with the baggage that they brought. Instead, you know, church, we need to unpack. We need to unpack those things. And, and leave those things behind us as we just open up the word of truth and as we explore what God is really telling us in his scriptures. Too often, Jesus and the truth that he brought become the product of our own construction and that distorts the biblical depiction. Too many times when we allow these things to, to get in the way, we add our own spin on things and it's not exactly biblical anymore. It becomes something other than what Jesus had said. You know, we say, don't offend. Let's make sure that we, we don't offend anyone with this message. It's got to be so benign. It's got to be so uh, easy that everybody can... But that's not the way Jesus was. Jesus was often offensive. He, he, was, he was offensive in some of the things that he said uh, by calling people hypocrites, by, by calling people a, a, a bunch of snakes. He called them these things, and he... And he spoke this truth into their lives and it was a, a, an awakening for some of them. Many of them of course turned a, a, a deaf ear to him and didn't want to hear what he had to say but many of them did and they heard him uh, saying these things to them and it, and it shocked them out of their comfort area where they could then listen and understand the truth. We say don't make it uncomfortable we've got to make it uh, so much easier but you know, his followers at the time when he was teaching they found him disconcerting. They, they didn't understand. Over in Matthew 9 and verse 10, their reaction to his law about marriage, the law that has been in existence since the beginning of time, since God created male and female, this law that, that he created us, one man for one woman for life. In verse 10 of Matthew 19, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. So this is hard to understand, Jesus. This is hard to actually do this truth. And sometimes today we want to be politically correct, but Jesus, he upset many of the established norms of the religious during his day. <clears throat> so many times, Jesus spoke, in, spoke of God in terms of intimacy. Jesus spoke about God in, in the sense as, as a father and a son. He told about what he did for him. 
You know, I'll tell you what, I think that we really need to rethink how we go about teaching other people because I think one of the greatest tools that each of us have is our story. And, and some will say, well, that's way too close to, to uh, doing a, a testimony or, or testifying. And, and let me tell you, yeah, I know that we're not witnesses of Jesus Christ. I know that we weren't there at the time. We're not eyewitnesses. But we do have a story, okay? We do have uh, an experience. We do have a life that we're living that has been impacted by Jesus Christ. And if we're not willing and able to tell that story to someone else, how are we ever going to uh, somehow talk into their life or, or speak into their life the truth of Jesus Christ? If it hasn't affected me, why would I think it would affect them? I want to encourage you. Think about your story of faith. How did you come to believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? Uh, how, did, how did Jesus change things in your life to bring you closer to the knowledge of the truth how did the truth affect you when you first heard it did it make you uncomfortable because many times the truth will make us uncomfortable and it should make us uncomfortable if we're holding on to anything besides the truth if we're trying to be anything besides just a Christian and what the Bible teaches us about becoming a Christian you know Jesus he spent time with questionable company he spent time with with those who needed a spiritual physician. Too many times we'd rather keep that type of people on Jerry Springer. You know, we'd rather just, they, let's just keep them on TV. We don't really want them in our house. We don't actually want them to be around us. We don't want to actually sit down to a meal with them. No, if you're going to have all that drama, just, just keep it over there, right? That's not who Jesus was, okay? And if we're going to be his disciples, if we're going to try to be like Jesus, we're going to spend some time with those people who need him, okay? And who need to know about him. And that's right where we need to be sharing our stories, where we need to be telling others what has been done in our lives so that they understand something could be done in their lives also because our God is powerful. Our God will reach out and our God will change things. Yet sometimes the truth, it's hard for us to hear. Sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. Also, the truth sometimes can make us miserable at first. At first, the, the truth could make you miserable, maybe even deep into your commitment to Christ, into your life uh, in Christ. It, it can make you miserable, just as we read of those in the Scriptures who have felt this way. Hearing and receiving the truth, it requires an honesty and humility that some people just never achieve. Some people just never can attain to the honest uh, reflection on their own lives. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, notice... Let's see, around uh, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. He says, don't follow the examples in the world. Don't follow those who would do their own thing. Follow those things of Christ in humility. Why? For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God? The Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. The Bible, the Word of God, the truth, it can cut right to the point. It can get right to the issues, and it can handle those things that we really need handled. It confronts us with our own frailty and our own limitations, and it demands that we admit that we've been wrong when we've been wrong. When we have been wrong, are we ready to admit it? Are we ready to, to turn our backs on those preconceived ideas and those things that were with us before and then step into the truth? In 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, starting in verse 10, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this reason God will send them a strong delusion, so that uh, they should uh, believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Why didn't they believe the truth? Because they had pleasure un in unrighteousness. Because they would rather have pleasure in unrighteousness than to know the truth. And so it says God allows them to believe the lie. God allows them to just live in this self-deception, in this world where, where what they think is more important than what God thinks. But the problem with this is, at the end of time, when reality is made clear by the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds and, and by the meeting uh, that is going to occur of the righteous with Him in the air and the condemnation that will also occur for those who don't believe, the condemnation that will come on those who have rejected the truth also will be just as clear and real 
because this is a, a confrontation that's painful. This is a confrontation that is uh, very, very hard to take, very hard to understand. It makes some people miserable to know the truth. You know, I, I think about uh, uh, Jeremiah. Over in Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah chapter 20, starting in uh, verse 8, talks about this. He says, I'm not going to mention his name anymore. In verse 9, he says, I'm not going to speak in his name. His word, it was in my heart already. It was like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. He said, I tried to quiet God. I tried, to keep, I tried to keep the message from coming out of my life. I tried to keep God from, from speaking through me and, and using me to affect the lives of others, or at least attempting to affect the lives of others, because so few actually listened to him. So few cared what he had to say for God. So many rejected him, and what a, what a miserable state that would be in. What a misery to suffer knowing the truth and then not being able to convince anyone else of it. It's like a bad dream, not being able to speak, not being able to, to help when someone desperately needs your help. Christians don't live that way. You don't have to live in misery. You need to speak out to others. You need to help them understand the truth. Over in Acts 18, Acts 18, starting in verse 24, it says, There was a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus, and this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, you hear that? He, he's, he's like Jeremiah, he's got it in him, and he's not gonna just keep it quiet. He's not gonna live in misery, just trying to stifle the word of God. No, he's making it known to, to others. He's fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. But notice what it says, though he knew only the baptism of John. So here's this great guy. And he's trying to affect uh, positive spiritual change in other people, trying to help them grow closer to God. But he doesn't know everything he needs to know. And it says in verse 26, he span, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, so here's two Christians, they hear the speaker, they hear what he's saying. And it's, uh, notice, it didn't say that, that they raised their hand in the middle of the sermon. They said, whoa, 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 you've got this all wrong. And embarrassed him in front of everybody. No, what do they do? They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, what would that have felt like? Can you imagine being the one trying to teach the lesson? Maybe it's happened. You're teaching a lesson, and you find out you don't know everything that you're talking about. You don't actually know some of the things that you're saying aren't actually relevant anymore and don't work. That's what happened to Apollos. So does Apollos get mad and storm off and say, I don't care what you say, this is what I'm going to teach, you know, this is what I do. No, he submits to the truth. He submits to what the truth says. They show him the way of God more accurately. Verse 27, when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So this man, he took the truth that was given to him, the truth about Jesus, the truth about baptism specifically, and then he continued to make sure he made that truth known to other people so that others could know the freedom that comes only from knowing Christ and from obeying Christ. Sometimes the truth can make you feel miserable when you, when you realize, oh, this isn't what I've always believed. This is the one I've always taught. And yet we have an example for us, this man of Paulus, just a regular guy just trying to do what's good and trying to help other people and he realized he was teaching the wrong thing about baptism and so when he was taught more accurately he started teaching the truth don't let the truth make you miserable no it doesn't have to be that way you can submit to God and continue to teach the truth applying the truth as God has revealed it to you that you might then make a difference in the lives of other people but besides being miserable sometimes the truth can be painful Sometimes the truth can, can be very painful in our lives. If we're not honest, we, uh, we might say that we just take it at face value. But the truth is, many times, we allow those things that cloud our judgment to get in the way. And, and even more often, we would like to intellectualize about the truth rather than actually doing the truth. We would rather talk about truth or maybe even hear a sermon about truth or, or, or uh, think about truth 
as an abstract idea, as a pie-in-the-sky idea that's not actually going to be something that's going to happen in my life. When the rubber meets the road, nothing changes. Because it's painful to change according to the truth. It's painful for us to have to adjust our lives to make it acceptable, to make it according to what the truth really is. In Acts chapter 2, we read here about, about a group of people who had this very thing happen to them. Peter's preached this gospel sermon. He's told them the truth. It says in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, notice what happens. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. It was painful. It was painful for them. They realized they had crucified the Messiah. They realized that they had played right along in the deception of Satan that had deceived people for so long. They had gone headlong into the wrong way rather than following the right way. You crucified the, the, the Christ, the one who was promised. Verse 37, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What a wonderful statement. What a wonderful question. You know, they're saying here, what do I got to do now? What needs to change? How do I need to stop doing what's wrong and start doing what's right? It's not just a matter of my mind, of changing my mind. It's a matter of actually accomplishing something, of changing something in my life. This is painful for them. And what did Peter say? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the same response that we should have today. It's the same response that we must give to those who want to become a Christian today. They don't want to live in the sin that they've committed in the past. They want to start a new life. They want to start a, a righteous life in Christ Jesus. The only answer that can be given when someone says, what must I do to be saved is the same one we find right here. Repent and be baptized for remission of your sins because God washes our sins away. He washes them away by the blood of the Lamb, and He accomplishes that in baptism. It's the, it's the uh, real world uh, obvious showing of the truth of God. It's a symbol that actually accomplishes what it symbolizes. We go down into that water. We're a sinful person, but we go into there, and we're buried just as Christ died and, and was buried. We die to ourselves. We die to our sin. We walk away from it, and we're buried into that watery grave. And then we're risen back up out of that water, out of that watery grave to live a new life, a resurrected life, a life in Christ. You know, the truth isn't something that we can just talk about. The truth is something that we actually must accomplish, that we must actually try to do. J.W. McGarvey once said, freedom consists in conformity to that which in the realm of intellect is called truth and in the realm of morality is called law. The only way to know truth is to obey it. And God's truth gives freedom from sin and death. What a true statement. This is the only way to know truth is to obey it. If you really want to know this, you've got to do it. It's not enough to think about it. It's not enough to talk about it. You've got to do it. And it's going to be painful when you do. But truth beckons courageous people who will stand against the current who will stand against the things that are around us, stand against the things that, that others would say about us, and forsake everything just to stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, rejecting any other thing that would get in the way. I think about the examples of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They wouldn't bow down to that image. They wouldn't bow down to it because they knew that wasn't true, that God was the one to whom worship was owed by mankind. And so they refused and Nebuchadnezzar said, I'll throw you in the fiery furnace. And they said, that's what you got to do, do it. Do what you got to do because we're not backing down from the truth. Where are men like that today? Who would stand there today and say, no, Jesus is the truth. My God is real. And this truth that he has given to me is more important than anything, even my own life. He said, if that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us. From your hand, O King. In Daniel 3 and verse 17. What wonderful examples to us. In Daniel uh, chapter 6, Daniel himself, he knew that the writing was signed. 
He knew that, that uh, King Darius had already said, if you pray to anything else besides me, you're going to be put into the lion's den. He knew this. What does he do? The next verse, it tells us he goes straight home, and as his custom was, he didn't change anything. This is what he always did. It's not like he's just doing it in defiance. It's not just this one time. This is just as, as he does it. He goes home, and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Daniel 6 and verse 10. Be men of God. Be women of God. And don't allow the truth to be infringed on by this world. In Ephesians 4, starting in verse 14, it says, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness uh, of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into all things, into him who is the head, and that is Jesus Christ. Painful. The truth is painful. But if we choose to stand for the truth, it, it means that all those deceitful plotters all the craftiness that is used by those who would try to deceive, it means that those are going to be turned against us. It's going to be turned against you if you say, no, but the Bible says this. It's going to be turned against you because you're allowing only the Word of God to speak through your life rather than bringing in your own ideas and your own background and your own baggage. There's no, let's just speak the truth and let's speak it in love. Let's make sure we're speaking the truth in love because it can soften the pain that others feel when we speak it. When we speak the truth, if we're not speaking it in love, it can just be a hammer that, that just hurts, that just causes so much pain that, that the person will reject it because of the pain that it causes. Let's make sure that as the representatives of Jesus Christ in this world today, when we share the truth, that we share it in love, that they might be able to accept it and then embrace it and live in the truth of God that they can have the eternal life that we all long for. Make the truth any more painful than it already is for so many. Let's stand with God and speak the truth in love. Of course, the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is really the beauty of truth, isn't it? For all the difficulty of hearing, accepting, and acting on truth, its value is vindicated in the outcome. The outcome is freedom. Deliverance. Deliverance from all the baggage. Deliverance from the, the preconceived ideas. Deliverance from being wrong. Deliverance into the arms of the God who created you. There in John 8, starting in verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. Then you'll know, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. And then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He said, If you abide in my word, if you do what I'm saying, they answered him in verse 33, We're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made, we'll be made free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son, a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. The truth will set you free. If you want to be free from sin, if you have a humble, teachable heart, that can be used by God not only to change your own life, but to then minister to others and change their lives for the better also. Enjoy the freedom that's only in Christ Jesus. The freedom that comes only when you submit to Him, when we put down those things that, that, that bring us away from God and that, that try to pull us back. And we let go of those things and let God lead the way. Allow God to direct our steps that we might be acceptable to Him first and foremost. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. I want to encourage you to recognize that there is a truth. That Jesus Christ, He came here to save you. To save you from your sins. To bring redemption into your life so that those guilts and those, those problems of the past can all be washed away and you can stand whole. You can stand firmly on the solid ground that is the truth of Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you are a Christian but you haven't lived like it, 
you've been living in this culture and it's affected you and made you feel wishy-washy about your faith, repent. Tell your father what's going on in your life and allow him to minister to you and, and for this church family to minister to you and to love you and to help you overcome whatever your need is this morning. While we stand and we sing. Is the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. for all there's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life now it flows while the waters roll let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes will you come fountain free will you come tis for you and me thirsty soul hear the welcome call tis a fountain open for all there's a rock that's cleft left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? For you and me, thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. For our closing prayer, number 570. <clears throat> Have our additional announcements after. 570. Each day I'll do a golden deed by helping those who are in need. My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I can. Life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days, and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. Where there will be no setting sun, while going down. Weary road. I'll try to lift some traveler's load. I'll try to turn the night to day. Make flowers bloom.